Hey everybody, it's Allie and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, September 11th. Finally, Sharon is getting her retrial. Retrial? Is that what it's called? Uh, do-over? <laughs> Uh, whatever, I don't care what it's called. It was nice to see her in a dress <laughs> this week. That was the most important thing. I was starting to get real tired of those prison blues. <laughs> so it was nice to see her in something else. Um, Victor has decided that he is going to take the stand and he's going to actually tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth this time. Uh, he's actually, I think, going to tell about everything that happened on the volcano. So next week should be pretty good. I mean, I think next week that'll all start to come out with Sharon's trial and we'll have that to look forward to. And I love that Victor is being so supportive of Sharon. I just want to say that right off the bat because I just feel like it's it's too bad that, that uh, he had to be the one to get her into this mess. I mean, he's he's there for her like her guardian angel, and it's so nice and, and fatherly, but really, he's the one that got her into this mess. If it weren't for him, none of this would have happened. Now, it's true, though, that Victor did warn her not to get involved with Adam because she would, of course, inevitably get caught up in this crossfire between father and son. But, Victor... Real love is not about helping someone only when they're doing what you want them to do. And that's the sort of sense that I have always gotten from this. Like, it, was, it wasn't until the moment that Sharon repented for not listening to Victor when it came to Adam that he actually agreed to help her. But that's not what real love is about. You know, you help somebody if you love them through thick and thin. And he really should have come through for her way sooner than now. So I, I, you know, I, I'm disappointed in him on many levels, but I'll take what I can get. <laughs> um, Avery has a few tricks up her sleeve, so I think we're going to be seeing Sharon out of jail uh, very soon. Uh, Avery is, 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 she has started to prove herself as a very cunning attorney in this whole pre-trial hearing that's going on, she, she tries to make it look like she's ill-prepared, like she doesn't really know what she's doing. She's like, she's kind of bumbling and haphazard and she's missing deadlines and this and that, but she's really just trying to lull the prosecution into a sense of security so that she can put the smack down <laughs> on them later. And it's especially beautiful because sitting in the prosecution seat is Heather, Genoa City's favorite attorney. So it's Avery versus Heather in this courtroom smackdown. And I personally cannot wait to see Avery take Heather to the mat. Like, I want to see her take her all the way down, get her in a chokehold. <laughs> That's what I'd like to see. I mean, honestly, I don't think Heather has ever won a case in her entire life. So that's great news for Sharon and for Avery. Um, as long as Avery is able to keep her eyes on the prize and not on her sister's man. I know that you guys are probably going to hate me <laughs> for saying this, but... I, in the back of my mind, have kind of been wishing that Avery would turn out to be a lesbian. <laughs> because I just think that would be so fantastic. Like, she's so femmy on the outside, but she's so butch on the inside. She really is. And I just, I have been thinking, like, that would be so much more of an interesting you know, storyline than just watching the typical love triangle that we've seen so many times, but I have a feeling <laughs> that that's not where we're going with this. Uh, I, I, I think that we are working toward an Avery-Nick 
Phyllis love triangle, and that's okay too. <laughs> Surely it would be putting a burr under Phyllis's saddle, knowing that Avery was after her man. I mean, Phyllis is so obviously still the jealous wife. She's still playing the role of the jealous wife where Nick is concerned. I mean, he was at the jail this week comforting Sharon after, you know, after the whole, the whole trial broke. And Phyllis walked into the jail, saw that Nick was comforting her, freaked out and left and walked away. And of course, Nick and Phyllis were able to, you know, rectify the situation by having sex later. And that's how Nick reassures Phyllis that the relationship is still on. But still, I just, I feel like, doesn't Phyllis know by now that Sharon is a part of Nick's life? Dead or alive? I mean, I guess the, the best shot she had of a Sharon-free existence was when everyone thought Sharon was dead, but that's not the case now. Sharon is always going to be a part of Nick's life, whether it's romantic or not, and Phyllis needs to learn to accept that. It doesn't matter what Nick says. He's always going to have, you know, feelings toward the mother of his child. So if you're going to be involved with Nick, Phyllis, you need to, to, to accept that. I just, I, 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 I question her on this because I, I know that if she doesn't get over the whole jealousy thing, then we're just going to end up back at square one. It's going to be the same old thing that we've always seen, except for, I don't know, this time maybe replace Sharon with Avery. I just would, I would be, I would be happy to see Nick and Phyllis living happily ever after. I would really like to see Nick and Phyllis's relationship work out, but that's not going to happen as long as she has this constant nagging feeling that she's always had that Nick is going to leave her. And I mean, I don't know, maybe that's what you get when you take somebody through cheating. Maybe that you always have that feeling that they're going to cheat on you too. But bottom line, either Phyllis and Nick's relationship is copacetic or it's not. And at this point, all Avery needs is to detect that Nick is Phyllis's weakness. That's her weak spot. And Avery's going to be all over it. Avery has come onto town and she it come into town and she has seemed like this nice altruistic help the little guy kind of person, but Avery and Phyllis are cut from the same cloth. They are pulling from the same bag of tricks here. And Avery actually saw Nick and Phyllis smooching it up at the coffee house this week and she realized in that moment that that was Phyllis's weakness and she knew that she was going to pounce on it. <sighs> Phyllis wants to tell Nick. I know that Phyllis wants to open up to Nick and tell him the whole truth about her sister, mainly because she's been lying to him about it for years and now that lie is like inches from biting her in the butt. So she wants to come clean to Nick about it, but she, for one reason or another, just can't seem to open up to him about it. So Avery is gonna open up to, <laughs> open up that wound for her, really. Phyllis tells Avery that she wants to talk to her this week in the courtroom. Phyllis goes to the courtroom to talk to Avery, and Avery, the little sneak, texts Nick and tells him to meet her at the courthouse, essentially setting up the scenario that Nick can walk in on her and Phyllis having this private family conversation. And boy, did he. Nick totally walked in on Phyllis and Avery having this argument. In fact, just as Nick walks in, Phyllis is conveniently saying, don't tell Nick that we're sisters. <laughs> to Avery. So Nick heard the whole thing and Avery set it up. That's a cruel, cruel trick, Avery. Cruel trick. I, I just, I think that Avery saw that this was the way to hurt Phyllis, the way Phyllis hurt her. So she jumped on the opportunity. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of getting tired of Sharon telling Sam that he needs to get a life. Every time she sees him, she's telling him, just you know, you need to get a life of, of your own. Sam uprooted his entire life 
in order to move to Genoa City to support Sharon, and all Sharon does is push him away. It's... It's, Sharon doesn't have to be in love with him. She doesn't have to lead him on. But I feel like she treats him like a dog. And I just, I don't like it. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I feel bad for Sam. Like, I feel, and I also feel like if Sharon is not careful, she's going to end up pushing him right into Victoria's arms. And I have a feeling that as soon as Sam decides to move on, Sharon's not going to like it very much. You know, she's telling him to move on, but I just have this feeling that as soon as he does, she's going to want him back. And I want Sam to be with someone who is emotionally available <laughs> to him. I think he deserves that. And I'm sorry, but at this point, that is not either Sharon or Victoria. Neither Sharon or Victoria are emotionally available for him. And I haven't talked about him in a couple of weeks. He's kind of been there in the background. But I just, I, I'm kind of feeling like Sam is getting relegated to this uh, best guy friend sort of status to all of these rich women in Genoa City. And I, I can't help but feel bad for him. I think that he deserves better than that. I, did you, I mean, did you guys see him in his... <laughs> designer jeans and v-neck red t-shirt this week. <laughs> it's a far cry from his plaids and his Levi's, but he was wearing a jean with a little bit of a, a little something on the back, you know, a little stitching on the back pocket that looked very like, I'm wearing designer jeans. <laughs> it was so cute. I just, I still have a soft, soft spot for Sam even though he's not in the main focus right now, but I like him. I can see that he is trying very hard to adapt to this life in the fast lane that he's not used to. But I also like that he is injecting a little bit of uh, country realness onto the scene in Genoa City. He, uh, he, he has a really good down-home kind of sense about him that I really appreciate, and I think everyone else in Genoa City is sort of appreciating it, too. Um, he <laughs> is seeing that Victoria is terribly lonely right now, and he's trying to help her in every way that he possibly can, and this week he brings home a dog <laughs> from the vet over to over to Victoria's house and Victoria opens the door sees this dog and she she seems excited right away she kind of takes to the dog right away but in the back of my mind I'm thinking Victoria is still a tight ass <laughs> There is no way that the Victoria I know would want that mangy mutt putting its paws up on her designer furniture. <laughs> I just don't see it in any way. They're, they're almost trying to, to build this bond between Victoria and Sam, and I'm not totally feeling it because, I mean, like, just bringing a dog into the situation is not going to make magic happen because I'm telling you right now, I know Victoria. Just wait until that dog starts chewing on her shoes and peeing in her plants and... <laughs> Humping her leg. Last week, YNR took us to the heights of pleasure <laughs> with the Ronan Chloe sex extravaganza. <laughs> and this week, no more sex extravaganza, but YNR followed up with some really nice tender moments between the two of them. So, Delia has leukemia and Chloe is wrecked. She's beside herself. She doesn't know what to do. Now, I don't mean to be insensitive. <laughs> For Chloe. I truly, truly do. But at the same time, I really don't want <laughs> this whole cancer thing to get in the way of my cloning. 
I want it to help facilitate my cloning. <laughs> And I really feel like that's what happened. What's, what's happening. I was so afraid that Chloe would use this whole leukemia thing as an excuse to push Ronan away. And that is what she did at first. But now she's actually starting to let him in. And I think this could be a connection point for them. And, I mean, she's starting to open up to him and she's letting him be around. And I am so touched that he wants to be around. That he wants to stay there to support her. Because he could have fallen off the radar. He could have left when she said leave. And he didn't. He's sticking around and he's being there for her. And, and just the way that he looks at her. It just ugh, melts my horny little heart. <laughs> I just love it. And Elizabeth Hendrickson was outstanding this week. They're both outstanding, but she really has rocked me in so many ways because Chloe is torn in so many directions right now. She has all of these feelings. She's feeling guilty and helpless and terrified and all of these emotions just read through so loudly on, you know, in, in her persona, in her body language, on her face, and Elizabeth Heinertsen is just doing so amazing. And where in the hell is Billy, by the way? Where the hell is Billy? All week. The, the topic has been... Where is Billy? And when and we can't believe that Billy is not here when his daughter is going through all of this and everyone is looking for him. Jack is looking for him. Victoria is looking for him. Jack actually even asked Victor to look for him. I'm sure he had to swallow down some pride to do that. So everyone is trying to find Billy. I'm actually surprised that Ronan hasn't offered to look for him. He's FBI. You would think that he's got to have some connections. But anyway, at the very end of the last show, Thursday's show, we see, after all of this buildup, finally a shot of Billy, a scene of Billy. And he is in what looks like the gutter. Literally, he looks like he's fallen into the gutter. He's lying down on the ground, I guess, beneath some type of grate. Like, literally, when you're walking down the street and you look and you see, like, like, teenage, like he's in the sewer, like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles sort of gutter. Like, like that, that, that's what it just looked like to me. He's, he's lying there, unshaven, and... Uh, seemingly hurt. He seems like he could be hurt, possibly even trapped. Like he fell down a well or something. <laughs> That's where he went. He fell down a well. I just, I don't even know what to think here. I don't even know what the possible explanation is. Please don't tell me if you know. I you know I don't like spoilers. I want, I want to be surprised. But anyway, Slice it. He's looking like a real jerk to everyone in Genoa City. Everyone, you know, thinks that he's just not showing up and he hasn't left an emergency contact information and he's just this horrible dad. But, but, you know, Delia needs a bone marrow transplant and he might actually be the only person who can can donate the bone marrow for her. That's the only thing that's going to save her. And everyone in Genoa City has been tested twice. <laughs> twice, three times, but so far nobody has been a match. And uh, I'm just guessing, but my YNR sixth sense is tingling and it's telling me that I, I don't know, I just have a feeling that Billy is going to somehow rise from up out of the gutter just in time to save his daughter's life with the bone marrow transplant and uh, probably the entire past six months of his life will be forgiven like that. Interesting little side note here, Tucker and Devon got donor tested at the same time to see if they could help uh, Delia and, and possibly provide the, the bone marrow transplant. And what do you know? 
both Tucker and Devon have the same rare blood type. <laughs> Will Tucker find out that Devon is his son before Catherine can enact whatever plan it is that she's putting into motion right now? And what is the plan? What is Catherine's plan? I don't know what she's thinking. I feel like she's up to something, but I don't know what it is. Catherine called in good old Mitchell Sherman <laughs> this week to revise her will to include Devon. She's making him an equal share heir, which is a huge deal. It's a major deal. Devon's going to get just as much money when Catherine kicks the bucket as Jill will get for all of her years of grief with this woman. And I assume that Devon will end up getting just as much as Tucker. I, you know, I, 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 is, is Catherine being family oriented here? Is she, is her, are her intentions good? Or is this more about taking something away from Tucker than it is about giving it to Devon? Is it about setting up some kind of, uh, you know, more business entanglements? You know, trying to, you know, more fighting over Jabot, more fighting over Chancellor. Is that what it's about? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. All I know at this point is that Ashley and Tucker got back together this week, which makes me so, so happy. So happy. <sighs> Tucker. Tucker's show of support during Delia's crisis coming to give to see if he could be a possible donor that showed Ashley that he is truly the man that she loves and that is all I need. Okay, well, those are my thoughts for this week about the show. Now it's your turn to leave a comment. Let me know what you're thinking about all of the happenings, all of the developments in Genoa City. It was a short week this week, only three episodes. I feel slightly gypped. <laughs> it's been a while since we've had this short of a week, but it was still pretty good. And I'm sure that we're going to make up for it next week. I'm sure there'll be plenty of drama to go around for all of next week. But in the meantime, let's kick around what we know so far. So leave me a comment. We'll chat back and forth. We'll figure this stuff out. <laughs> As always, I, I look forward to hearing your thoughts about the show. So, that's going to do it for me for right now. But um, I will be watching with you. I'll be thinking of you guys. And I will be back here next week, same time, same place. And we'll chat again about the show. All right, you guys. I love you a ton. See you next time. Bye.